Several years ago, while I waste uh, time drawing up my PowerPoint, several years ago, I had the idea to do a uh, video, and I wanted to do it while it was fresh in my mind, and so I set up a camera and came out here and did it. There was nobody out here. Now, I made it look like that there was people sitting in the pews, because I'm looking over here, and I'm looking over there, you know, and, um, but Sterling came in on me, and I had on a pair of blue jeans, tennis shoes, and a suit jacket and tie on, so, but the camera never saw that. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, well, I take a few minutes to get there. Um, while I'm doing this, um, I got a text message <coughs> a little while ago. I got uh, something yesterday from Michael. Is that the same? Is that our interpreter? Two different people, right? Okay. Um, we had uh, a, one of the pastors that helped organize our pastor's conference uh, in Turkana passed away of COVID. And um, sad, sad situation. So we're going to pray uh, for his family, his congregation, and all of those that are affected by that. Uh, we also have another member of our staff that is sick. We're going to pray for them. And then um, we, we did our feeding. I'll, I'll show some pictures of that uh, here in just a few minutes uh, during the morning service. Um, but as is the occasion, as we're feeding people, we always run, a, run across some, some pretty serious hardship cases. And um, one of them was a lady that had just given birth about three days prior. She, of course, had not eaten in days. Um, the baby had no clothes. And um, it's pretty sad when you see how the other half lives. But uh, baby had no clothes. Lady hadn't eaten in several days. And uh, so I told Michael, let's try to make sure that this lady has some food. I don't want that baby to die. Amen. And uh, of course, we here in America, I complained this morning. I'll say me. I'll, I'll talk about myself this morning. I complained, got angry because I was in line at McDonald's. And a young punk tried to get ahead of me in the drive through And I honked my horn at him. And I got angry. And I thought, he better not pull in front of me. And then I drove away going, Mike, why do you do that? Why is it so important that this guy has to go behind me? And then you think about what you're doing and the big scene you're causing, those are called first world problems. Third world problems, you cry because your baby's screaming because he has nothing to eat and is going to die. First world, we cry because we didn't get first in line at McDonald's. But that's, that's how it is. All right, Revelation chapter 2. Uh, pray for the various people that we saw and met. Uh, that our staff saw, I think, over 850 people we were able to feed with enough food for a week, or at least a week, and um, pray for the lady that just had the baby, pray for some others that we met, uh, some young people that we met. There's, I've got pictures of some cute, cute, look like twin boys. And um, so anyway, I'll show those in a little bit. Revelation chapter 2, we started this last Sunday, uh, Jesus commending the church at Ephesus. Generally, 
as you read through these letters to the churches, there is usually a commendation followed by a condemnation. There is something that Jesus wants changed at that particular church. Um, there are some exceptions. There's one church that Jesus does not condemn in any way, and there is one church that Jesus does not commend in any way. You might be able to guess either one of those, but we'll find out as we study this out. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These sayings saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them, which are evil, and how thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Now, I asked this question last week, if you were in this church, the church at Ephesus, and somebody came in and said, I am Apostle Jim Bob, okay, from the church in Podunk, Arkansas, and you need to listen to what I say, would we be able to refute what it was that he was saying, his claim that he's not an apostle? Because we don't believe that the apostles had what is referred to as apostolic succession. Nor do we believe that the Holy Spirit still calls people, or men, but in some cases it's women, to be apostles. We don't believe that. We believe that the people that Jesus called to be apostles in the New Testament... He's already called them. He's not calling new ones simply because these died. That's what we stand on and that's what we believe. And there's a real, real important reason why we believe that. So, if, if this was our situation, we had Apostle Jim Bob come in here and say, I'm Apostle Jim Bob, would we be able to biblically refute his testimony or reject him and say, you're not an apostle? Would Jesus commend us for rejecting him, saying, you're not an apostle. Would we be able to do that? And so uh, the question came up several years ago. And you'll, if you listen to some Christian radio, or you, I'm sure all you got to do is type in the word apostle on YouTube, and you're going to find hundreds of people who claim that they are an apostle. There is... Um, one up in St. Louis, and I couldn't remember his name last Sunday, and we have a follower that follows us, and his name is David Taylor, and he's watching now, I know him. So the guy up in St. Louis, Cubby, have you ever heard of him? Anybody ever heard of him? The Apostle David Taylor up in St. Louis? He was on the Prophecy Club uh, back during one of the times that I was on the Prophecy Club. And I remember listening to him, and, but then the founder of the Pro Prophecy Club told me some things about him, that he had gone on tour for the Prophecy Club, and the guy's morality was absolutely shameless. Stan had to kick him off the tour. And what he was doing was, and I don't mind saying this, the guy always carried an entourage with him, bodyguards, like the prophet in Kenya. And I'm going to release that video today. So be praying for our radio stations in Kenya uh, because there is a very bad, evil, false prophet in Kenya. Has a lot of people fooled, okay? And he has an entourage with him. He always got these big, bulky, look like Secret Service agent guys. Well, this David Taylor would always travel with his entourage, which included several females that were not his wife. And during the tour, he had one of these females in another room. Well, he goes down to her room in the middle of the night, knocks on the door and said, Jesus told me to come down here. 
Yeah. So there was a lawsuit against him. I don't know whatever happened to it. There was a lawsuit against him. But he claims that he's prophesied the future. He prophesied on the prophecy club. By the way, none of his prophecies ever came about. And if he's only wrong one time, remember the rule is, Deuteronomy 18, if he's wrong one time, he's not an apostle, he's not a prophet of God. He's, he's, a, he's a phony. He's a forgery. He's a fake. And so just the fact that he calls himself an apostle, I reject outright simply because of the scriptures. We looked into this part last Sunday. The fact that, and let me uh, draw your attention here, verse 21 of Acts chapter 1, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, number one, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So the qualification was that he had to have accompanied the apostles while Christ was alive. Number two, he must have been a witness of his resurrection. So um, they found two men, verse 23, they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, Whose surname, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, probably because he only had one name, and the other guy had like 16 of them. That was just a joke. But anyway... And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, here's one thing that just stands out in this text. Simply because Judas fell out of his office, fell out of his place, and literally fell and burst open, why, does G why do the apostles have to elect somebody else? Why do they have to? Anybody want to take a guess? It's an easy guess. Yes, Gary? That's exactly what I was looking for. Gary gets a piece of candy. Uh, you'll have to get it from D because I don't have any. So anyway, 12. How many tribes were there in the Old Testament? 12. Jesus called 12 disciples. One of them is out. Why do they have to fill that spot? Why they can just leave it? Well, okay, now we got 11. No big deal. Because the number had to be 12 and there is absolutely no indication from scripture that it goes beyond that now we have one exception who was that exception the apostle paul clearly clearly god called the apostle paul uh, so acts chapter 2 verse 42 they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship because one of the things we know that God, the Holy Ghost, called apostles. We know that. And remember what the word means. Called out. Apo means away from. Called out. The ones who are separated out. Sort of from the rest of the group. Um, we know that they wrote and were the founders of the doctrines of the New Testament. So when someone claims the office of apostle, what they're saying is, you have to do what I tell you to do or you can't go to heaven. That's the implication of it. In other words, they get to determine what doctrines everybody can believe or they can't go to heaven. Now, it's different in just the churches around here because none of us pastors are claiming to be apostles. So just say because somebody goes over to Second Baptist, does that mean they can't go to heaven because they're not going here? Because their doctrine's a little different than ours? No, it doesn't mean that at all. I'm not saying that if you don't believe everything I say, that you can't go to heaven. Brother Jim Waymire over at Second Baptist doesn't say that either. Okay, No pastor that I know of, with exception of Father Bob over here at the Sacred Heart Church 
They, of course, say, if you don't believe what he says, you can't go to heaven, but we don't. But that's the implication. The apostles wrote the doctrines. They came up with the decrees that you either believe them or you don't believe them, and if you don't believe them, you're not going to heaven. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So, and we have two witnesses in the Bible telling us that the doctrines have already been written. First place I want you to turn. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. The second place you might be able to guess, but this one, um, I like this one. First Corinthians chapter 13, this is the charity chapter, chapter but Paul says this in um, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, the, he doesn't mean that the prophecies won't come to pass. He means that those who are prophesying them will, will cease. Number two, um, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And he says in verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now here's what I think that means. During the formation of the New Testament, you have the apostles, you have the guys writing out, you have Luke writing the story of Jesus and writing um, the book of Acts. During that time, the only scriptures they had was, number one, the Old Testament, and, number two, whatever copies of letters that the apostles might have written, like Paul or James or whoever. That's all they had. They wouldn't have received the entirety of the New Testament until when? When the book of Revelation was written. Book of Revelation was not only the last book of the Bible, but it was the last one as far as the timeline was concerned to be written, somewhere around A.D. 95. So, gen so it was the last book written. And they wouldn't have had the book of Revelation. In fact, most of, the, most of the people had already died or had been put to death by the time John received that revelation. So it was of necessity that in the churches that someone prophesy, but they would be prophesying in part. What Paul wrote, Peter didn't write the same thing Paul did. Peter wrote about other things. John likewise. John didn't just copy what Paul wrote and write it down. He wrote other things other than what Paul wrote. And he wrote things other than what Peter wrote. So John has a part of the New Testament. Paul has a part of the New Testament. Peter had a part of the New Testament. But they were in part. Now, in the next verse, where was that? Hang on. Verse 9, for we know in part, we prophesy in part. Verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So once John writes the book of Revelation, and the churches start compiling together all of the books that they have been given, all the letters, the gospels, and so on, now that they have that, is there any need for someone to jump up and say, wait a minute, I have a prophecy from God, or I have a word from the Lord. Is there any need for that? No. In fact, once John's letter, once John's uh, revelation was sent out to the churches, as of that point, God was signifying to them, there will not be any more words from God. They're finished. And do we not believe that the Bible we have is perfect? Is that what we believe? Was it perfect when the apostles wrote it? Absolutely. So that which is in part is done away when that which is perfect has come. Is there any more need for people to speak in tongues? Because 
I mean very quickly, within 50 years, in fact, it was 50 years, A.D. 150 was about the time that the very first that we know of translation of the Bible or of the New Testament was being made. Simply 50 some odd years after John had written the book of Revelation and had passed on, now we're already having the Bible translated into the languages of the day. It was called the Italic Bible. It was written in Italian or a form of Italian or whatever language that was back then. And it was translated. You have a guy by the name of Ulfilis who was translating the Bible into Gothic back in those days. So the Bible's now being translated. So is there any more need for people to speak in tongues? No, it's being translated. Okay, the word, now that the perfect word is here, now it can be translated as a whole and people can read and understand it. So as far as the gift of tongues or the gift of prophecy or whatever, those things have no more need. Once John wrote Revelation and he died, do we need any more apostles? No, we don't. So Revelation 22, the very last thing written in our Bibles, verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. So once John's revelation made it out to the churches and a guy comes in and says, I'm a prophet, I'm here to give you the word of the Lord. Do we need him? Should we listen to him? Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. This is one of my things about, and you got to, wait till you see this watchman. It will curl your hair, cubby. It'll grow it first, then curl it. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by who? By his son. His son speaks to us through the entirety of the word. Through the Holy Ghost, the spirit of God's son, Jesus Christ. So now that you have this, the whole of the Bible, which is the whole counsel of God, it is everything that God says to mankind. So once we have this, and somebody comes in and says, I have a word from the Lord. Do we believe him? No. No. Unless what they're going to say matches what's in here but almost without fail when these prophets come along they don't just come and quote scripture they come with new words from god i can well let me ask you this what did joseph smith do did he just tell everybody just believe the bible he wrote an entire New Testament, another testament of Jesus Christ, a third part of the Bible. And according to the Mormon church, not only that, not only is the Book of Mormon equal with the Bible, but it continues on. They have a quorum, which is a council of 12 men, and a latter-day prophet whom they elect and he speaks in the place of God just like the Pope does. He gives them basically the same religion as Roman Catholicism. And whatever they say and whatever they add to it is as equal with Scripture as the Book of Mormon is. So they have, these poor Mormons, have the Old and New Testament plus the Book of Mormon plus the Pearl of Great Price, which was written, I think, by Brigham Young, and then the Doctrine and Covenants. This whole, I mean, they've got, and these, the Doctrine and Covenants keeps being added to with every new prophet and every new quorum of 12. And whatever these guys say 
is doctrine. You have to obey what they say. So then it becomes an elastic religion. It becomes a rubber Plato religion. It's formed and fashioned in whatever shape they want it to take as time goes on, which is what some people want to do with our Constitution. Let's remold it. Let's reshape it. Let's make it into something other than what it was intended. And I am an originalist. I believe those guys were smart enough to write out what our laws should be. And I think we ought to follow them. Amen? Uh, so anyway, but that's what you get into when you have somebody saying, I am a latter days prophet and I'm giving you words from God. They are then guilty of adding to what God said past the book of Revelation. I heard a guy, uh, he was preaching, it was on YouTube, and he gave a different date for the book of Revelation. He said, the book of Revelation was given to us somewhere around A.D. 60. And I'm going, well, that's not true. That ain't true. No way that's true. Then I had to ask myself, why did he say that? Why did he say that the book of Revelation was given some 35 years earlier than what it was? Because his date for the book of Revelation said it at the same time that Paul was still writing epistles to the churches. So that Jesus, it says in the end of the book of Revelation, if any man shall add to these words of the prophecy of this book, I shall add to him the plagues that are written therein. So setting the date of the book of Revelation back to AD 60, it sort of negates the idea that you can't, God doesn't come down here with more words. Because obviously Paul wrote some things after the book of Revelation according to their dating. So it could only mean that you can't add to the book of Revelation any more things. That's pretty slick. So, and I went, I guarantee you that guy believes that God is still raising up prophets to prophesy over everybody and give them new words from God. Yes, Gary. I got a Go ahead. Four, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He gave some apostles. Right. Paul, James, Peter, John. He gave them apostles. He gave some, during this time, prophets as well. Now, do you know what the word prophesy means? In its purest form, I'll read it to you. Ezekiel 39, Therefore thou son of man prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God. Definition's always in the Bible. The word prophesy simply means to say what God said. Okay? So... If I, what I just read you, therefore thou son of man, prophesy unto Gog and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog. In that sense, I just prophesied to you because I said to you what God said. And you believe, of course, that he's against Gog, right? And you believe it. Why? It's in the word. Okay. And my point is this, because the Holy Ghost gives the daughters and the maidens, obviously, the ladies have and can have the gift of prophecy. They're allowed to prophesy. They're not allowed to usurp the authority of men in the church. They're not allowed to be pastors and bishops. They're allowed to prophesy. What does that mean? Put scriptures on Facebook or share the gospel with people. Nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, ladies, share the gospel with your husband, share it with your children, your grandchildren, share it with your neighbor. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? But for a woman to usurp authority in the church, whatever, that's wrong. Let your women be silent in the church. Of course, that's what Paul said, okay? And so during the time of the writing of the New Testament, definitely there were prophets. There had to be. I mean, Peter was prophesying, but even that, what did Peter prophesy? He quoted from Joel, didn't he? 
And if you notice, Paul, always careful, as he's relating to us the mysteries of the gospel, he's still sticking with scripture. He said, as it is written by David, or as it is written by, in Isaiah, or whatever, he's quoting the Old Testament. So, there's a guy, watch the Watchman broadcast today when it comes out. Okay, you'll see what I'm saying. There's a guy in Kenya, and he is big noise out there. He's made friends with some high-ranking politicians, okay? And believe it or not, before he comes into a town and preach, he makes people go out with soap, water, and brushes and clean the street for him to ride in on. They're preparing the way, okay? He's a dog. This guy is a dog. His name is Prophet O'War. He always refers to himself as the Lord's mightiest prophet. And he claims that he is the mightiest prophet that God has ever sent. Now, what he says, does you cannot find in the scriptures. And in that sense, he's lying. God never said it. How do we know God never said it? It's not in what we know God said. Can Cubby come in here and say, God told me to tell you something? Why not? You won't believe it? It's not in the book. Okay, so yes, Paul said the Holy Spirit did give some apostles and he gave some prophets. But as of the book of Revelation, and once it's been written and distributed, there cannot be any more new words from God coming down. We have everything that we need to know. Everything. And I've, I've been through this personally. Because when I first started studying prophecy, I was listening to the Prophecy Club and these guys talking about they're having dreams and visions all the time. And I wanted that. I asked God repeatedly for that. Three times I asked God for that. And God said, Mike, here are your dreams and visions. And God finally made me understand that everything that we're going to need to know. Uh, very quickly, I know the bell rang, but let me give this one more passage here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, Paul's saying that the scriptures contain the thoroughness of God. Everything that God wants us to know and everything that is knowable about God is contained in these 66 books. The Holy Ghost signifying by putting 66 decorations on the menorah in the tabernacle. He's telling us 66 books, that's it. There are no more. So yes, the Holy Ghost did give them the ability to prophesy during the New Testament days. But once the book of Revelation is written, the only thing that I can prophesy of is what's written in the book. Does that clear that up? Father, we love you. We thank you, God, that the scripture has every answer to every question we just need to ask I thank you Lord for those that ask I thank you Lord for the Bible giving us the answers to believe and father we do trust this book and anybody who comes along now to make claims that are not written in this book I don't believe them and your people won't believe them either and father we know the internet is full of lies, lying signs, lying prophets, lying money grubbers, people making claims about things that are not even close to being true. And Father, the people that believe them have abandoned your word. And I pray, dear God, that you would bring them back to the safety and the comfort that is in your word. Bless us today and bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.